Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. You'll never have the sacred stone. <laughs> And welcome back to another edition of the Vegas Squares podcast, middle of the week. It is our golf betting show. We've got a full house back in studio here, the Zoom studio. We've got Token Tony. We've got Tony Johnson. And we've got John Parr, all of us back in here. Gentlemen, I want to talk not golf to start out here. We're going to talk about, obviously, there was a game on Sunday. Uh, Maybe you caught a glimpse. But uh, Super Bowl 55, I tell you what, I could give – I could walk down the middle of Las Vegas Boulevard and if people were actually being transparently honest, I may find less than five people who thought that's the way Super Bowl 55 was going to go. Yeah, you're damn right about that. I mean, let alone how low the score was compared to what most people thought. I mean, they, they thought probably right around the low 50s to some people even upper 60s. Well, it's funny you say that, Tony. And Tony, you'll probably understand, you know, agree with me here. I mean, the total opened a lot of places, 56 and a half, 57 and a half. It actually came down. Hmm. Yeah, it did. Uh, and yet the books, I think the great majority of them actually did well and made money uh, on it. They took, a, from what I understand, a ton of public action on the over, but they liked the spot that they were in. They, they, I think they were pretty pleased with the number that there was. So they didn't even move the, the total. I, I think I heard from M, was it MGM? No, I, I think it actually might have been the win that uh, they had a full six-figure swing um, on Sunday, just bets on Sunday with people that were betting the over. And they, nice. didn't, they didn't move the number at all. Uh, oh. So they, uh, they kept all that. So, yeah, it was um, – I think the books were pretty pleased, um, despite the fact that based on the number movement, it doesn't look like they would have done well. Um, but they just – the public just got throttled uh, on side in total. And I think that was the main – the main outlier really is it's not always the, that way. You know, we saw it. Uh, I know that the, uh, the sharp play in the new England LA Rams, uh, Super Bowl was very heavy, uh, on the Rams, but, uh, you know, sometimes the public gets it right. No question about it, but certainly not in this one. That's for sure. Yeah. I think, uh, we're, we're getting in contact hopefully to have Todd Dewey from the review journal who covers all things betting in this city, uh, on the podcast on, oh, good. on when we record on Friday. So, Hopefully he'll give us some insight and some clarity because uh, I know that I read a, a stat that actually, despite the amount of money wagered, I think the actual total win for the books was somewhere around twelve, thirteen million dollars, which doesn't sound. I mean, it sounds like a lot to a guy who's you know betting twenty to fifty dollars a prop or twenty to fifty dollars a bet, but you know, to the collective of sports books, you know, thirteen, fifteen million dollars is not not that much money. But the the amount wagered this year was significantly lower because of. COVID-19. So that, that obviously had a hand in it as well. And, 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 you know, it's crazy. A lot of people did have, you know, the unders, but you're right. The, the action kind of evened out. So, you know, winning the juice is, is where they're at at the end of the day. That's, that's what they want to do. You know, not really have to fade aside. So, um, you know, we're going to talk about that in our, on our Saturday show or our weekend show. We're going to talk about our props. We're going to grade our props. We're going to look at all that, but this week we're going to talk golf. And before we do, John, we're still waiting on your Super Bowl prediction from last week. <laughs> wow, that was the perfect lob slam dunk right there. I really appreciate that because, uh, gentlemen and uh, people of the uh, – gentlemen, ladies of the, uh, of the listeners, I'm sorry I didn't give out my pick, but I did, uh, I did text back to Aaron after he – very politely asked me to uh, after his, my one and done pick to put in my Super Bowl pick, and I did. I took under fifty four and a half, uh, which ended up being at fifty six. So I got it in at fifty four and a half, and I got it in at fifty six, and I got it on a teaser with Tampa Bay, uh, and uh, so Tampa Bay and the under. So it it came in really well for me, really well for me. But uh, you know, first and foremost, just Aaron, just please. 
let him know. I did text the degree. It is fair. He had the pick in. Know. It just wasn't public. It's fair. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think this all just sounds much. convenient to me, actually. I don't know. I don't know if I don't believe anything. <laughs> you know what? I'll well, tell you this. John, John Parr is a Florida boy, so if he did not pick Tampa, uh, he okay. would not have been able to be on the podcast. That's hey, listen. Fair. Listen, fair, every, uh, when I, where I grew up in Pensacola, Florida, our closest team was the Saints. And the, when I was growing oh, really? up, the Saints had the bags over their heads. <laughs> the Saints, they were three, uh, hours, three hours away. Everything down there is college football, Auburn, Alabama, LSU, Florida State. Uh, you know, you get some Georgias and some Miamis. And, uh, about Valdosta State, the powerhouse, baby. Oh, of course, of course, of course. But let's get on to golf, Aaron. Let, let us know what's <laughs> going on this week. All right. Well, we're going to recap this waste management. It was fun. Uh, Shocker, Shoffley, another T2. <laughs> as well as Tony Finau over in Saudi Arabia. These guys are just <laughs> out of freaking matic. True. Out of freaking matic. They, they, they don't choke, but they're not clutch. So <laughs> I don't know. What do you describe that? I mean, I mean, Jack Nicholas did it a lot. And, you know, we don't even talk about it because of the amount of, of majors he won. But Jack Nicholas did it so much in his career. And, and uh, you know, but you got to have the wins with it, too. Absolutely. I'm going to take over here because I did in my one done the last two weeks. I have a T2 and a T2 from Tony Finau first week and uh, the latter and Xander. And uh, these guys, it's so good. It's just what's happening on Sunday. I can't believe it. Same thing happened with Spieth this week. And we loved seeing Spieth in, yep. in, the, in the hunt. And can you believe those shots that he hit on? I think it was 17. I think it was uh, – 15 the par five he tried to kill it and it rolled 60 yards into the water and then 17 he goes he hits it on the right side of the green and it rolls into the water uh down the line so well just uh, when he, yeah. he hit the first tee shot off the planet so you kind of knew sunday was going to be tough for him so it was t- it was tough and uh man i'd love to hear token and tony's response on the uh the the tournament this weekend well well tony we talked about it last week i mean the, one of the first things we, we looked at triple digits and I said, how, how crazy is it here for Spieth to be fallen so far down here and looking at this? And I mean, we, and then I think it was token that texted the very next week that he had jumped all the way back up 25 to one. Like it, it was like a, they, yeah. they just, they, they leaked out a little bit and Jordan Spieth said, all right, let me show you. And uh, boy, the, the books went right back up. Yeah, well, I, I think there's there's some reasoning for that. Certainly, his record here uh, in this tournament, Spieth, is quite good, and the field, uh, you know, re- losing DJ was, was was pretty big. So everybody got adjusted a little bit. But um, that, that, that yeah. was before DJ opted out for it. Okay, fair yeah. enough. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's um, you know, he's got a really good record here, so there's no question about that. Um, yeah, I, I was impressed. I was impressed with. You know, the all-around game, um, I think, you know, Jordan had re- two really, really good rounds where sort of everything came together. Um, you know, it's just he still has issues hitting fairways, um, you know, still missing the ball both directions. You know, that first round, he only hit two fairways, uh, was able to survive. Uh, to me, that was a pretty telltale uh, uh, sign as well of, you know, not necessarily, you know, things are going to be hunky-dory, uh, you know, uh, going forward here. But, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good start, at least. It's, a, it's, a good, it's something to build on. Um, and, uh, yeah, no, I was, um, I was quite impressed. It was, it was some really, really fun golf on both tours. But, uh, no, I'm just going to quickly weigh in on the whole Shoffley Finau thing. You know, I just – I think the comparisons aren't fair. Um, you know, Finau has been on tour twice as long as Shoffley, and Shoffley has four wins. Uh, mm-hmm. Finau has oh, one. Yeah, so uh, – and, and Shoffley's wins are against the best of the best. He's got three incredibly, you know, high-quality field wins. Um, so – I don't know if it's a comparison necessarily. It's just yeah. un- uncanny how they literally run parallel like this. Yeah. Lately. I think it's more impressive that, you know, the fact of how many seconds and third Shoffley has, I think is actually even more impressive. I think it makes his resume even better uh, just because he's always contending, especially mm. at the really high quality fields. He seems to do best in high quality fields where Finau is literally the exact opposite. He seems to do better in one-off events in half fields, out in Saudi Arabia, things like that. It's uh I think Tony's issue definitely is mental. I don't think there's any question, any doubt about that. He was right there. He had he he had DJ on his heels. DJ couldn't make a putt in the fourth round. He was fucking atrocious on the greens in the fourth round. He couldn't read a putt. He couldn't do anything. And Finau bogeyed the easiest hole in the course on 17 and just basically took himself out of it. And it's uh, it's inexcusable. 
Uh, I mean, it, it really is. Um, you know, that's my take on it because uh, I watched that one from pretty much start to finish uh, that tournament more so than Phoenix um, and the waste management. And uh, he's got he's got some issues coming down we the should, stretch. We There's no question about a, that. We should have a section on who gets second, but actually is going to be a novelty or someone that actually wins tournaments and people that get second because they're choking. Cause there's, yeah. Yeah. I agree. I, I yeah. think there's a, there's a definite uh, difference. I, I couldn't agree more with you can that. build a John Vanderbilt statue in the room. <laughs> oh, yes. Look at Jack. Jack is, you know, and, yeah. and look at dude. So I was looking at a stat this week and it was uh most seconds in the la- worldwide in the last, what, 20 starts or whatever it was. And it went, Xander, eight. Third was Tony, and then who's second? DJ. DJ, of course. Token, you're you're completely right, and that's the Jack Nicholas, that's the Tiger Woods, that's the Phils. You, those guys that yeah. finish second all the time, they're in the hunt on Sunday. Most of the time, these guys are so pissed off at them for beating <laughs> their ass for so long, they actually come out and they play better because of it. And they That's beat for the game. Of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I can't agree with Tony more about to- uh, Tony. Fe- <laughs> it's too many Tonys. <laughs> too many Tonys. There are too many <laughs> of us. Tony, Tony, Tony. Tony. <laughs> Token, God, yeah, Token yeah, Tony yeah. Fee now. Token Tony Fee now. Ooh, ooh, yeah. ooh. Yeah. Uh, t- Tony Fee now is definitely going to be one to consider betting if – you like somebody to start out hot, like especially in these decent fields. Like if you can find like a first round uh, leader with a dead heat finish, he's definitely one to look at and get some value on. Otherwise just look at him matchups because it's going to be a train wreck down the stretch in my opinion. And you're not getting no, you know, value. Obviously there's no number value at all for Fina because he's clearly there every week. So I I think it's matchups only. I I couldn't agree more. I wanted to circle back one thing with space before we move on here. And and he's, I was reading, I think it was golf digest online. And uh, it, it said for years, he was chasing distance at the cost of winning or at the cost of even competing. Um, I know this is a one-off. May, I hope it's not a one-off, but it, it uh, you know, maybe at this point in his career, after seeing what's it been four years since the Masters debacle, maybe even five, and maybe at this point he, you've got to kind of humble. You're not Justin Thomas. You're not Brooks Koepka. You're not uh, Dustin Johnson. Maybe you've got to humble yourself down. That if you want to compete with them, you know, maybe he's one of the guys. We'll talk about this uh, maybe down the road here. Uh, maybe some of the guys maybe in favor of the distance controlling uh, equipment uh, that uh, is a hot button issue with Roy McIlroy and others. I don't know. I, I, I say that mostly in jest, but uh, if, if the rest of the pack can come back to Jordan speed, he doesn't have to chase distance anymore. Maybe he can get back on it. But. I think it's a good take. Uh, he's going to, if he's going to win tournaments, he's going to beat people on the greens and then around the green. Um, and I'm probably going to take some difficult inclement weather, you know, tough courses, things like that. Uh, you know, a lot of his wins and a lot of his great play have been on these type of courses, you know, things out like in, in Fort Worth at colonial, um, you know, where he always plays well. And, uh, uh certainly here, uh, here in Pebble beach is a great example. He's got a great record there. Um, and those are always, you know, can be very, very difficult conditions. Um, you know, shorter courses as well to both of those. So I think that's, I agree. I agree with you, Aaron. I think you had to embrace what you're great at. Um, you know, when he was winning tournaments, he was annihilating the field on the green. And, uh, you know, sometimes that, that's, that's his game. You know, that, that's his game. So, um, you know, it's not going to be the way that, uh, uh, you know, some of these other bombers are, you know, are going to win tournaments, certainly. Um, but uh, like, you know, Patrick Cantley, when he wins in a week, yeah, he's going to putt really well, but he's certainly not winning because of, you know, putting and, you know, shots around the green. Uh, it's just, you got, you got to play to your strengths. And uh, I, I don't think Jordan has done that in the last few years. That's for sure. Yeah. And token regarding Shoffley and fee. Now a wise man once said they pay a lot of money for 20th. Well, they pay a lot more money for second. Uh, <laughs> that's a very wise statement from a wise man. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, John, what about our boy bookend 71s to really kind of take himself out of contention? Billy sizzle. Yeah, fucking Willie Sizzle. We love this guy, don't we? Uh, it, it's one of those things where he's going to roll through the year, and, uh, you know, my whole uh, Harris English thing hasn't really uh, panned out, but I still like Wizzy, Willie Sizzle for the rest of the year. I don't like him this week. He hasn't played at Pebble, and Pebble is one of those courses where 
uh, you need some experience, sort of like Augusta or whatever. But uh, if you don't mind, Aaron, I'm, I really want to weigh in on this uh, distance issue here. Uh, I, I sincerely believe. Well, let me ask you this: a quick anecdote before. What do you think about Rory's comments last week? I think they were spot on. You know what he said, and and I remember uh, texting you guys last week about how he said we need to focus on skill instead of distance and this is just going to elaborate my point that i'm about to uh about to tell you guys so you have 14 fairways around right you know you have generally you have give or take yeah yeah we have four part threes so let's make nine out of the 14 fairways bottleneck at 310 let's make five bottleneck at 280 290 okay Give those guys a chance and let's grow the rough that's the biggest thing we need to grow the rough and we need to tighten the fairways okay so grow the rough tighten the fairways do the nine to, nine to five ratio and let's get it on it's unfortunate that a guy like tim clark who i used to love watching play you know uh these guys that hit hybrids a lot of the time on these 495 yard par fours and stuff like that i love those guys because that's who i am <laughs> in all honesty I, I hit it 250 and i'm way behind all my playing partners but that's okay with me because i love hitting my little forward that's like 25 years old <laughs> <laughs> but i i really think what rory said was spot on he's a bomber so he's thinking about the good of the game, and he's talking about how it's all about skill. Look at Pebble Beach, where we're playing this week. Look at places like Marion. They have these small, you know, uh, sort of Pinehursty tabletop greens, and, but you have to grow the rough out. That's the problem with the PGA Tour right now. I really don't think they're growing the rough out long enough, and they're not making the fairways tight enough, and you guys can expound on that. What do you think, five or six inches? No, 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 not not nearly that much. Uh, Tony, what do you think? I mean, I think you're dead right. You're dead right. Four, I mean, that's four, there's, four inches, right? Four inches. I think there's a lot of ways to combat this. I think growing out the rough is definitely one of them. Um, I'd also like to shave areas off the green too. Um, I don't think that's utilized nearly oh, enough maybe. either. Yeah. Oh. You know, penalize people for missing in the wrong spots. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. There'll be a few players that'll complain and bitch and moan about how you know it's quote unfair. You know, I miss a sh- I, I, you know, I miss a shot by three feet and it goes into a collection area. Well, then don't hit it there. You know, I mean, it's it's <laughs> really Sergio. Quick. Simple. You know, yeah, I mean, and there's only going to be a few, there's only going to be a few guys. Uh, everybody else players. will understand, you know, and, and you're going to see, see guys shoot away from pins. That's the problem, though. Uh, the tour doesn't really want that either. You know, the tour wants guys shooting at, you know, shooting at pins. Uh, it's more entertaining that way. You know, you have these runoff areas. If you mow and shave, uh, you know, outside of greens, guys are going to shoot away from some pins. It, it's just, they're going to do, they're going to do it more often. So it's a, it's a give and take, uh, but I think you, I think you're dead right. You know, grow out the rough a little bit, uh, you know, thin out the fairways. These are things you can do in the weeks leading up to a tournament and then bring the course back out to where you want. Yeah, it's going to take some time. It'll take some weeks, but you don't have to totally screw your membership. You don't have to screw the public. Uh, again, it'll take some time to get it back in, but I've seen courses maneuver fairways before, uh, and it's very doable. So I totally agree. I think you, I mean, you're, you guys are making great points for sure. Let's make, let's make 50% of, this, of the tournaments super hard. Okay, where we're tightening everything up, you grow out the rough, make it nasty like at uh, Torrey Pines, like when Tiger won, stuff like that. And make the other half to where you're shooting 20 under or 19 under like Brooks did this week. Yeah, cool. just have a mix. Token, I mean, token has made that yeah. argument. We've had this argument on a few episodes, and token, that's exactly what Token has said. You know, split, yep. it, split it however the percentage you really want yep. to. If you want to make you know, yep. 60% of the tour hard, harder and you know 40 percent of the tour easier that's that's fine i mean like you said guys like sergio maybe even our boy patrick reed might have some complaints but hit better shots better golfers and yep. and but the question really becomes and rory i think nailed it on the head is we're not talking about the, the 150 to 300 guys who are on the pga tour with the the distance controlling uh, measurements that'll be in place we're talking about us you, you, you know john you said you hit it 250 i mean 250 would take all my might. I, I'm a 230 to 240 kind of guy with a driver. And, you know, and that's probably the best I can get. If I swing any harder, the ball's going to go off the planet like Jordan Speed's tee shot. So, and I don't mean in a good way, not straight. 
So, you know, you're affecting me. I mean, think about the guy who's sitting there, a weekend warrior who's considering clubs and all this stuff. And, and now you're telling them, you know, we, we can make the course. We don't touch the course, but now we've, we've lopped off, you know, 20, 30 yards in a drive. I played Paiute today, uh, me and a buddy with, uh, uh, we, we were paired with some guys who were senior citizens and, you know, with the drivers, they're a buck 70, buck 80. One guy shot 78, but, you know, he doesn't have to hit that far. Wow. Can Amazing. you imagine knocking? Wow. I love that. I know. Wow. Can you imagine knocking off 40 yards from wow. this guy? I mean, you can't do it. You can't yeah. do it. That was wow. the Tim Clark of the Paiute Tour. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a really yeah. impressive uh, yeah. score. 78, for, yeah. Speaking, speaking wow. of the Paiute Tour, I spoke to the guys at the shop, and they are – they're in touch with uh, all the corn fairy stuff, and it's 60 40 lean. Limited fans will be there, so hopefully, we'll be there. Nice. In April. Fantastic. I, I love the idea of the Vegas squares going to uh, Paiute for let's, this corn fairy tour. Let's hope it trends towards more towards the allowing fans and maybe even more fans because, you know, we don't want to, we don't have to be fighting anybody. We want to be out there, you know, kind of. And then maybe if our boy Cleo can Monday qualify, who knows? We'll see. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, all right. That'd be amazing. He talked about Dustin Johnson. He won at Saudi Arabia despite Finau's uh, issues, like you said. It's crazy. DJ, last three starts, three wins, three seconds, a third, a sixth, and an 11th. And the 11th was in Hawaii. He was probably, you know, uh, taking some time with his wife there, mind focused on other things, which who can blame him. But, uh, you know, it's just it's crazy his dominance. You guys kind of already talked about it here, but uh, the field may, may have gotten lucky this week token uh, with dj not coming back that's just a lot of travel and a lot of lag exactly i mean it, it takes out a lot not only on these guys to uh, let alone physically demanding i mean that that far of a flight and that much demand on their body sometimes they just need a week off and i mean i'm sure he likes pebble he's a good fit for pebble but it just sometimes easier to pass. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I mean, I, I hope we don't see Dustin Johnson incorporate the old Tiger schedule where we see him maybe six times a year. So uh, I, I can understand this one. This is a lot. This is a lot to, to take on. And a lot of those guys aren't there this week. But yeah. uh, the one thing I want to talk about, Token, you brought this up, is uh, we're obviously going to get into the Pebble Beach Pro-Am, but um, I want to talk about this as well. The, the lasers, the scopes, the GPSs are going to be allowed – on the on the uh, on the tour during majors, I was really shocked to see. I'm not shocked to see that the GPS devices were allowed. I'm shocked to see that they're going to roll this out during majors. What are you guys' thoughts on this? Yeah, I'm very shocked that they came out and made that statement. But it is only going to be for uh, distance to the pin. It won't be elevation changes or, or any type of measurements for that. They well, you know, Patrick Reed will Patrick Reed will get all that. <laughs> Not going to say he's not going to try, but when he tries, it, I mean, at, at, at least if they do allow it, they should have some control over it. And yeah, I mean, I mean, do you, do you like this? Do you not like it? I mean, I, I, uh, I've only used one one time in my life and it was, I thought it was wrong. It just seemed wrong. And I'm not saying that every, you know, I'm anti GPS device. I just, I feel like uh, I've never – I mean, I'm not the greatest golfer by any stretch, so you guys can obviously, uh, you know, touch on this. But uh, I, I, don't, I don't particularly love them all that much. I, I'm not for it for the pros, for sure. I, I'd rather see them rely on their caddy for yardages and their caddies sometimes even in, like, a tough fly spot. They'll tell them it's a little harder just so they – get over the hazard, like, uh, say, a deep bunker or something like that. If they know the carry is, like, 105, they'll be like, it's 108 to carry instead of 105 in certain situations like that, That's depending on point. the golfer and all that. So, like, their they're mental uh, – that they know how to work with the golfer mentally. And how much of an advantage can these give them, John? Listen, the, with, it's a huge advantage, and uh, it's a lot like what we do – in poker uh we, we are all poker players and we know how to deal with people because we've worked with a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds and it's a psychology thing right when you're playing poker uh to win money and it's same thing in golf and what these caddies do they'll say something and they'll stand a certain way to make you give yourself a 
one percent edge by standing a certain way as a caddy. I, I'm a huge believer in that. And maybe maybe you give them a little look, or maybe you give them a little smile, or whatever. It's a very uh, psychological aspect. A caddy. Uh, that's why you see a lot of changes in caddies, which I think is okay. It's sort of like changing a putter whenever uh, you're not putting too well. And I think these caddies on tour notice that, and, and they aren't really. They understand they're just going to get cycled around. It, these are not the people like Joe LaCava that uh, went from Fetty Couples to Tiger Woods. These are the people that are just, you know, regular, uh, you know, two handicaps that are just good sports psychologists as far as I'm concerned. And, and Tony, I mean, I'm sure you've seen your fair of, of or share of range finders and, and, and all of us have, but – I mean, how is this going to be policed? I mean, you got uh, – I hate to keep beating up Patrick Reed, so let's just pick some. <laughs> you got Xander Shoffley up there, fifth hole of a major. Where's DJ Singh at when you need him? Uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, fifth <laughs> hole of a major, he, look, he brings the scope to the eye, and all of a sudden he sees that the slope, you know, all the slope's all there. And he's like, oh, shit, I forgot to turn it off. Like, you, you know, what do we do? We just uh, – like we talked about Patrick Reed, we just do an oopsie. We don't need to call a rules official for this, you know. Are we, are we allowing the ones that don't have the slope? I mean, there are some $150 ones that don't have all that kind of bells and whistles. Yeah, I'm not really sure how all that's going to go. Again, it's a, you know, the gentlemen's and gentle ladies game, uh, you know, at the core. So I, I would expect the great majority of guys, you know, if that does happen, you know, will let somebody know. Because, uh, again, I think that's just the way the game is played by the majority of uh, guys. But to me, I don't think those will – probably not move the needle all that much you know again guys are creatures of habit um you know they, there is like a you know pre-shot routine and things like that my guess is this would be caddies uh the majority would be utilizing these things i highly doubt players will be touching them um you know in, in these three rounds i just especially in a major i think when you want to be as consistent as you can be um and the fact that you can't you know utilize elevation you know as you said and things like that um i, I just don't know if they're going to be really all that widely used um, you know, as you said, I think token, you know, brought up a really good point that, you know, balls that are in the rough, um, you know, how you can get a club on it, you know, and how the ball is going to react to that. You know, that's really way more important than knowing the exact number, you know, to the hole, um, you know, how the ball is going to come out of the rough slash the fairway slash whatever I think is way more important. And that's the true, you know, mark of a cat, you know, as John said, you know, these, these guys are, you know, not just good psychologists, but, you know, they understand, you know, the ball and, you know, how it can really be affected, you know, wind, weather, grass, things like that. So, um, you know, again, I, the only thing I worry about, uh, as I always do with pretty much everything, and I'm not a big range finder guy because for this main reason is, uh, pace of play. You know, I'm a relatively fast player, um, especially for someone that I think spends actually quite a bit of time around the green. Um, I actually still play pretty quickly and, uh, I'm worried about that because the the tour has a, has an issue with pace of play. Uh, not just this one, but the LPGA as well. And they've talked about allowing range finders as well. Uh, and I just don't think it sets a good precedent in general. Um, I don't know. Uh, that's my only concern about everything really is pace of play. They're not policing that at all still. And now you bring this into account, which could have an issue. And uh, I just, the game needs to be played faster. Yeah. I would love to weigh in on this, Tony. You made a lot of great points. And the thing is with me is uh, I feel like we're, we are both field players. And I, I love to be a field player than rather than a range guy. Uh, you said you're not a fan because I, I like to look – Sam Snead, perfect example. He always, he always gloated about how he never looked at a yardage. He just looks at the flag. And he know he knew he knew how to what club he needed, and that was amazing. Uh, and he's still going off on Tiger on how he won more tournaments than he did, I guess. But <laughs> he was still one of the best people in the game, and that's how he played. He he looked at the flag. He didn't need to know a yardage, and and I think that's something. Uh, I think that's something great about golf. Don't make it too. Uh, Bryson DeChambeau-ish. Something in the middle. You know, and I love Bryson. I like it how he sort of changed the game. He created his park, but I still like the feel aspect of it. I mean, to me, I fall in the middle. Like I said, I'm not a big range finder guy myself either, but I do take generally what the card says to, to, to gospel, and I go for the middle of the green like Mark Leishman tells me to, and that's 
that's my strategy. So, uh, I mean, if I start implementing slopes and, and things like that, I think I'd probably just have myself up. So, uh, we I'm would not, not not be a good scramble team, me and you, Aaron, because we do the same thing. So we need someone <laughs> like Tony to go for it for us. I guarantee an outsider. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Last thing I want to throw at you guys. Um, I want to talk about this because I had some arguments on Twitter. Uh, a lot of people out there saying that golf is dying, blah, 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 and this. And, you know, I, I take the approach of that it's not. And obviously the uptick in 2020 with the coronavirus pandemic even makes it more stable, in my opinion. Uh, the distance uh, shortening devices might change that. But uh, I thought a big win for the golf is not dead uh, side is, is this that I just saw recently here. There's that Top Golf has a plan in place for a 10-year plan to actually start incorporating themselves with a lot of city municipal courses where the first one here is in El Segundo, California. A, a, a course in El Segundo, the municipal course, um, is going to basically have a Top Golf facility there as well with this nine-hole course that they basically are going to lease to Top Golf. And it seems like it's going to be a plan that a lot of these municipal courses are going to have top golfs with them. You know, if you're not familiar with top golf, obviously it's a big fun driving range with drinks, fun. You know, we have one here in Vegas. It's great Hard to practice. Yeah, but um, estimated revenues. Now, I mean, obviously that's estimated, but each of these in the in the right areas is supposed to bring about at least fifty to seventy five million dollars for these cities. And I kind of like the idea of these municipal courses, and maybe if it even gets bigger, to you know some other you know privately owned courses, not private courses, but privately owned public courses that, uh, you know, how do you guys feel about uh, a, a top golf coming in and, and maybe potentially revitalizing golf to the casual fan, which is what we always talk about. In my opinion is a kind of average golfer at best. Uh, I just, I, I think it's great for the game, get more people interested in, maybe somebody that would actually swing a club like say once every couple of years they do it a yearly tradition or something go out with some buddies or something that might even become more and more closer to each other and make it almost like a weekly kind of bowling league kind of situation yeah and i mean we're talking about there are some points that the golf is dead camp makes that there are golf courses losing tons of money with real estate and maintenance cost and et cetera. And, um, you know, this golf course in El Segundo, it's actually a nine hole municipal course uh, over the last three years on average was losing $275,000 a year and couldn't sustain another two years and adding this top golf to it. I think, you know, even if the course doesn't gain any more players to it, I think the revenue from top golf alone just keeps it afloat, which is fantastic. Yeah, listen, I think this is an amazing venture by uh, Top Golf, and uh, I haven't really been a fan of Top Golf as a uh, true golfer. It, it is sort of a, uh, I don't know, happy Gilmore type thing. It's, it's, a, it's uh, a gimmick, yeah, absolutely. It is very, but it's great. I think it's great for golf. I don't like playing there, but it's going to get other people into the game. That's the big thing, and and that's huge. Uh, and and one thing I've seen going out and playing golf, and I play golf every week. You guys play golf every week. And what you see, there's more women on the golf course. And I think that's a very big thing uh, that we have. You have 50% of the uh, population that we're not utilizing. And now women are coming out and playing, and they're enjoying it. You can tell. They love it, mostly because of the outfits, of course. But <laughs> I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah, which the outfits are great too. But you could tell uh, they understand it's something you could play at any age, and that's huge with golf. And I'm 40 years old, and I'll say that forever. Uh, you know, anybody can go learn how to play. I don't know. I don't care what age you are. You can give it, go out there at 70 and go chip and putt, right? And when you, and when you go to a top golf, they have games, and there's just ambiance and experience and everything there for you so even i mean i've gone to top golf here in vegas and not even picked up the club before so, all right i'm a, you know just the, the experience alone listen i i said number one and i'm tell you top topic number b topic okay? number b <laughs> <laughs> all right listen this is the biggest thing is that you can utilize the nighttime okay mm -hmm. yeah so 
let's let's get let's get courses to just have the driving range just like uh a couple places we have around las vegas we have a couple par threes out here we have a couple driving ranges out here we can go utilize at night one of my favorite places i look over the las vegas strip why i'm hitting balls at night that's a good and they one. have a bar, they have a bar right there and i love the drink they got a pool up top <laughs> yep. yeah yeah no i mean i mean i'm talking about top golf i'm talking about uh, las vegas golf center but oh okay yeah what that's i'm saying is that, yeah and, and you have the bar right there uh you know you can go and they, they have live music and stuff like that. And that's what golf should be about. It shouldn't be, shouldn't be about uh, going out and sh- shooting in the seventies or shooting in the eighties. It should be going around about meeting people. And that's what top golf is great about. And I, I really love this invent- adventure that they're, they're going to go on. And I support it in any way. Lock me up. I probably have like, Nine hundred and sixty-five dollars in my checking account. I'm in. Just throw it all in there, and I'll I think that gets you uh, half half an hour at a bay. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, uh, truth of that. So I kind of look at this, and I mean, obviously, Top Golf's been around. The la- the first, my first uh, interaction with it, it has to be probably two thousand and eleven or twelve. So it's been around for almost the better part of a decade here in this spot, and uh, even though the the cart game before the horse i i kind of look at this tony as uh what i'll call kind of the bar stool effect the and john said it you know the the laissez faire approach to golf we're not going out we're not all going out there trying to you know emulate dustin johnson we're all going out there having a good time maybe putting some music on having the pill on the cart there and uh top golf just kind of personifies that now not every top i've been to a few of them not every top golf is las vegas top golf but i think you know, you can have that new age driving range slash entertainment experience, you know, which don't usually go hand in hand. And now we've kind of, they, they've kind of done that. And when I say barstool effect, I meant barstool sports, you know, you kind of, they're the guys in golf media who everyone, the old guard hates. And they're, they, instead of, you know, firing back at them, they're like, dude, just chill the fuck out a second. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, uh, you know, as, as things change and we evolve and, uh, you know, the generations, you know, are certainly different, um, you know, than their parents and grandparents and such. And uh, they're just attracted to different things. You know, we see this here, I think the, you know, comparison here to the Las Vegas and what's inside the casinos, you know, from 30 years ago to now, you know, it's just, it's, it's not as Digital gambling, gambling centric. Stuff, yeah. Sure. Absolutely. And you know, how many more restaurants there are, you know, per casino than there used to be, you know, and, and clubs of course, and pools. And it's just, you know, di- different things. Um, you know, people are interested in different stuff. So certainly I, I think it's uh you know, it can't be a bad thing. You know, I, I'm a little bit curious to see what Callaway will do because I know that, you know, Callaway just, uh, you know, bought them out for, you know, $2 billion or merger of, you know, some some regard. So, you know, that'll be a little bit fascinating. Uh, I did not know they, that. Great. Yeah, it came through in November or December. So, uh, I think for $2 billion or $2.5 billion. So, we'll, we'll see. Um, you know, they have a pretty strong, you know, hold in, uh, you know, around the world, especially in Europe. They've really expanded uh, in Europe. So, um, you know, time will tell to see, you know, where that goes. Um, but Callaway has, you know, hasn't made a lot of missteps in the last 20, 25 years. They've expanded, uh, you know, business and done an exceptional job uh, really in a few uh, markets, not just in the golf, you know, club selling markets. So, yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's been interesting. You know, the, my first experience was back in Chicago in 2005 when they only had two locations, uh, you know, Alexandria, Virginia and Chicago. And uh, that's the first one I went to was Alexandria, Virginia. Right? Yeah. So it's. Um, no, it's a uh, it's a good time, and it's certainly uh, it's nice to have, as you said, you know, not just an eighteen hole, you know, muni. You know, if you don't have four and a half hours or five hours to kill, or it's nine p.m., you know, at night, you know, this is a, it's certainly a a good option, no question about that. Yeah, and the revenue brought in from Top Golf because we we we, yeah. we joked about it, but it's not cheap, you know, and especially when you go in peak times, it's it's not cheap, and I know that it's even cheaper. The ones that we the one here in Vegas is more expensive than the ones around the country, but it's right. again. And they have, you know, it's, 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 it's expensive. I mean, or it, it costs what it costs, but uh, that money will go to help save these courses. And, and that's what I think is the big thing. And, you know, I, I kind of took the stance in the arguments on social media is, you know, if a course closes, it, it closes, you know, there's, yeah. sometimes there's too many courses in an area and Agreed. you're the worst one, then, you know, capitalism takes, takes form there. So I'm, I'm okay if a, if a course 
like uh, what's the one here? We talked about it a couple episodes ago. The one that has the ditch running through. You you uh, you love it. Oh, uh, um, if that course closed, would we all lose sleep tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Token would. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, no, I, I, I've always been in that camp too, Aaron, and I'm a you know, big golf proprietor. I worked in the industry for you know, years, but uh, w- there were too many courses that opened. You know, the Tiger effect was not ideal. Uh, they built too many courses, and too many of them were built very, in a very difficult fashion, uh, turned a lot of people off because, uh, you know, and, and Jack Nicholas is the one thing he said that, that he regrets is taking all these contracts to build very, very difficult courses because uh, it's just not good for the game, and it's, uh, a, you know, it, it has not worked out. Um, a lot of Jack's private clubs, uh, well, I mean, a lot, comparably speaking. I think they, they've he's closed 8 or 9% um, of the private clubs that he built out have, have now closed and or changed hand. You know, there's there's been a lot of movement. Um, and it's, I think, due partially to the not only oversaturation of the market, as you mentioned, Aaron, but I think the difficulty of some of these courses is brutal and not good, not good for the average player. You know, uh, nobody wants to go out there and struggle mightily on a course. Yeah, and, and hopefully these, if, if Top Golf is, if this is successful, they can start latching onto a lot of these courses. They don't have to necessarily build the big, you know, megaplex facilities, but uh, to just be able to support the courses, if this can be a success, I'm, I'm all, I'm all for it. So, all right, uh, let's take a quick commercial break, just a couple of minutes, and back on the other side. We won't uh, delay any longer. We'll get into this Pebble Beach Pro. Am in quotations. We'll talk about that on the other side here. Just a, just a couple of minutes here. Welcome to my bookie. You're ready to create an account and start making money. And we're here to help. And remember, you can get a bonus of up to $1,000 on your first deposit. Now you're ready to bet. Just go to mybookie.ag, visit the sports book, click on your bet, and input the amount you want to risk or win in the bet slip. Yes, it's that easy. Just remember, at mybookie, you play, you win, you get paid. Amazon, we're pretty good at getting things done. We're pretty good at solving problems. COVID-19 is the biggest challenge we've had to face. The challenges are what motivate us, like flying masks to our employees around the world. We're doing everything we can to get you what you need and doing everything we can to keep our people safe. I'm former Navy pilot, Sarah Rhodes, and I'm proud to lead our Amazon Air Network. All right, and we're back here with the Vegas Squares Golf Betting Podcast. Myself, Token Tony, Tony Johnson, and John Parr. And it is the Pebble Beach Pro-Am, which uh, unfortunately for the the 2021 season, we are going to drop the AM. That is kind of the big big news here. Uh, Like a lot of these golf tournaments in the pandemic, uh, Pebble Beach is going to look a little different this week, you know. Uh, The no fans, the no ams, the no celebrities, but uh, we've got a pretty decent field here, and um, I'm sure that while it, you know, the initial shock of it, you know, we'll we'll get over it real quick. I'm sure the players might love it too. We might get some quick rounds in uh, the the five six hour rounds, maybe not even that long, but uh, you know, with a lot of celebrities, we like seeing celebrities play golf, but maybe not with the pros in an actual formal setting. But uh, I could be in the minority in that. I, I like to see those pro. The, the Lake Tahoe one's one of my favorite ones to watch, especially. But um, thoughts on this year? I mean, obviously, we know Pebble Beach. Tony's going to give us a course outline, even though we all, you know, if you're a golf, or golf fan, you know Pebble on, Beach. Yeah. But, uh, you know, uh, people think U.S. Open for Pebble Beach. But this is still, a, you know, a fun course to watch golfers play golf at, John. Yeah, uh I'm first of all, if you don't mind, I'm gonna disagree with you wholeheartedly on the field. The field sucks. 
Uh, it's awful. I said we had a good feel. <laughs> no, it's awful. Listen, we're looking at uh, we're looking at wow. we're looking at Harsh. Phil Mickelson. Phil Mickelson is a headliner right now. Do you understand that? Well, Phil Mickelson will always be a headliner. He's not a favorite. He's all time le- leading earnings winner in this tournament. <laughs> it, all right, gentlemen, I, I really want to ask you guys. I'm looking at it right now. Is Dustin Johnson not going to play? It was out yeah. on Monday. Yeah. yeah okay, he's so he's out. All right. Yes. Uh, but I mean, so look, we now, got Cantlay, Burger, Casey, Speed, Dave. Yeah, wow. True, man. What Billy, a, Billy what Sizzle. A, <laughs> Josh Theater. What a, what a great field we have. CT Pan. I, I think it's great sometimes to watch these guys. Alex Norn. Probably, probably a few <laughs> All right, calm down. There's probably a few guys that are going to get on TV that you don't see. Hey, Token. I bet More you got Henrik Norlander, don't you? Just like me, Henrik Norlander. I love him this week. But uh, Pebble, <laughs> we'll, we'll get into that a, a little later. All right, all right. Let's talk about the let's talk about the amateurs this week. Uh, the pro am. I'm it, this is I, I'm sort of uh, discontent with uh, Pebble this week. First of all, uh, you're only playing Pebble. Uh, you're only playing Pebble Beach. Uh, I'm which Spyglass too? Yeah, Spyglass Hill. Uh, Unfortunately, okay, you can go through that in the course outline. Is uh, I might have been <laughs> off there, excuse me, but the field sucks. Okay, and this is the best golf tournament. I, I don't know. I I feel like non majors. This is my favorite golf tournament. Non majors outside of TBC. So let's say those five. This is my favorite tournament to watch each year. Wow. And we're the, you know, poor Bill Murray. Bill Murray is like the best person in the world and he can't go play this wow. week i really feel bad for him. well he is playing a little charity <laughs> event with larry fitzgerald so you can watch that i think that was to, i think actually think that was today <laughs> are you serious thank god man because that guy is the greatest person in the world and i know he loves this and he greatest is a headliner in here. the world <laughs> uh, i was you thinking know, of Mother Mother Teresa. it's bill murray <laughs> i'm telling you everybody knows bill murray is well, let's say one of the greatest people in the world. But wow. you know, we're we're in there, you know, right behind Bill Murray, but uh we're in there somewhere. But either way, uh the pro ams is what makes it fun for this one and the in the uh the fact Tony can go through the course outline and let us know where we're playing this week. But uh <laughs> I, I, I do I, I do I do love Pebble Beach. Okay, let's talk about holes. Let's talk about number seven. Okay. Let's talk about number 18, which it might be the best hole in golf, honestly. We've had so many great stories come through there. Uh, you, you got so many great holes. Eight and nine are amazing. Uh, right along that cliff right there. And, and uh, this is an iconic golf tournament. And what's happening right now, I feel like, I feel like a lot of guys on tour, they're scared of Pebble Beach. They're scared. They they don't want to play Pebble Beach because they think it's going to go on their resume because they don't like the variables. And uh, I think this is huge in golf right now to where, just like we were talking about earlier about growing out the rough and tightening up the fairways, they have these publicists now that are going to tell them, hey, you probably shouldn't play this course. So these managers are saying, play this course, play this course, make it easy on yourself. Um I love Pebble Beach because it has a great history, especially like people like Bob Hope and like Frank Sinatra and like just people that have gone through, you know, uh, the history of America and and we need to embrace this tournament. Well, we wow. and in twenty and in twenty twenty two they'll all be back except for you know Frank Sinatra and Bob Hope. Bob Bob Hope was right there in this one. <laughs> Rainbow Romano gets my vote. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, not as good as Bill Murray, but you know, I played pie gal with him once with Sonny. Oh, very nice, very nice. <laughs> wow, very nice. Very nice. Uh, very nice. Does anybody want to go after that one? <laughs> I I don't know how yeah, to really follow I, that did up. I drop that the was, mic right there. Was, really, was, really, really drop the mic and get into the line course line. outline <laughs> for wow. where the fuck we're playing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't have, a, I don't really have a lot to introduce it. Like I said, you know, wow. it's it's just it, it's a different feeling this year. But you know, once the TV cameras are on, you see the pros. Yeah, it's not great that the amateurs aren't there, but you know, they'll be back next year. We're kind of living in a, a funky little uh, bubble for. Well, however long they decide we were going to live in it, but 
<laughs> Bing Crosby. Bing Crosby. There you go. The old clam bake. <laughs> yeah, the clam bakes. They love those clam bakes. Oh. I wish I was there. Hey, if I could go back in time, I would not go to 1985 like, uh, you know, Back to the Future did. I'd go to, yeah. They started in 1985. <laughs> yeah, that's probably where it was, right? It might have been there. All right, so we, uh, without further ado, Tony, you can uh, give us a course outline. I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn down John Parr's mic a little bit. Well, we're back to a full field here, a 156 person field. Uh, they've, they've expanded the field since there is no amateur um, presence, so we're gonna go with the full 156. Uh, it's gonna be a tight uh, race here. We get any sort of bad weather, and it'll get backed up pretty quickly. But uh, you know, we shall see. We'll get to that in a little bit. But um, as we mentioned earlier, it's just gonna be Pebble Beach and Spyglass Hill this year. We're not gonna play uh, the Monterey Peninsula course. Uh, that will probably come back next year as well. So just like how they did it at Torrey Pines. Uh, you on Thursday you're going to play one of the courses and on Friday you'll play the other one and then on the weekend Saturday Sunday be back to Pebble Beach on both days uh, just a quick rundown here with Spyglass Hill that's the one I think that most people are not as familiar with uh, par 72 7041 yards it's a challenging layout but again um, the challenge comes from like a lot of these coastal courses are up and down um, you know the California coast uh, weather and wind uh, you know are really the the, the the biggest teeth that I think that the course can have. Um, if the, if the wind is down, especially at spyglass, uh, you're going to see guys with some short irons, um, into some holes and it, it is gettable. Uh, that course also is 5,000 square foot greens. Um, they're going to run them only at 10 on the stint meter as well. So it's going to be quite slow, uh, comparatively speaking to where Pebble beach is, <clears throat> which we know, I think, one of the hallmarks of that course, not just some of the holes that play along the ocean, but it's these really, really small potion stamp style greens, only 3,500 square feet on average. They're the smallest greens that they do play regularly on the tour, uh, uh per given year. Um, the biggest change and the change that I think is going to be fascinating is if this can actually happen is they're going to try to get these greens to run 12 on the stip meter. Usually they run 10, 10 and a half uh, most years. So the goal is 12 uh, with the lack of rain, it's possible that is going to affect scoring uh, drastically. So, um, you know, we'll see if that's possible, but that's what the tournament committee wants to do. Um, but again, uh, you know, again, we know this course very well, so I'm not going to get into, you know, a lot of that, uh, the one, one main defense, as we know, can be the wind, uh, especially coming off the coast. It can be very, very difficult. But some of the things that aren't really talked about that much, difficult bunkering uh, around around the greens um, and just the greens themselves. Uh, so uh, over the last three years, the second fewest putts hold from four to eight feet are here at Pebble Beach. Um, it's, a, it's a difference of 0. 0.2 strokes per, uh, per round uh, on average per player, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but that can really add up. Obviously, it's almost, you know, a one stroke uh, per person uh, for the entire tournament. So, you know, really huge uh, in regards to, you know, putting on these POA greens, which are, can be bumpy and can be difficult. Um, you know, that will be a telltale sign of how many, how many short putts you can make at least, um, you know, throughout the week. But, uh, as I mentioned before the weather, um, you know, Thursday, we're going to have some pretty, uh, pretty benign conditions, no wind. Uh, but Friday is where it starts to dictate here with the wind in the 10 to 15 mile an hour range. And then into Saturday and Sunday, uh, we're going to see some gusting, uh, 25, sometimes 30 miles an hour, it looks like. And then there will be some pretty decent rain. It looks like on Saturday as well from the AM into the early PM time. Uh, I think this is really fascinating. And you know, we talk about what we're looking for with a player, you know, with a certain spot. Um, to me, I'm going to look very, very closely on Thursday and Friday. And if this wind is still expected to pick up Saturday going into Sunday, I'm going to be very, very adamant about playing, about fading non-wind type of players, you know, players that aren't really necessarily good in tough conditions and or players that are not as familiar with the course. You know, John brought it up uh, earlier. You know, guys their first time here tend to really, really struggle. If they happen to have a couple of good rounds, especially maybe they get a, you know, really good round at uh, Spyglass on Thursday or Friday. Those are the guys you want to be fading going into the weekend when the wind picks up and it gets very, very difficult. Uh, so what we're looking for with a specific player, um, you know, driving distance we found over the years means absolutely nothing here. Um, on average, players all distant, all drives average 274, um, which is the shortest uh, on tour year after year. So guys aren't really hitting drivers all that often even. Uh, so again, distance is not really what we're looking for. Um, it's a second shot golf course. Uh, it's a GIR uh, uh, hotspot. You've got to be able to hit greens. These greens are so small anyway that it's it's being accurate with irons. It's why guy, you know, we've seen guys like um, you know Kevin Streelman uh, and others you know do 
do do well here in years past just because it is an accuracy type of course. Um, ball doesn't go anywhere, though. Uh, again, we're at sea level. It's going to be cold, mid to high 50s for, mo for the most part. So if you do get to, get to some spots um, where it's late on a Sunday, you know, those two par fives on the back nine are going to be important. And it's tough. That's why DJ, and one of the reasons why DJ has actually been quite good here is he's murdered the par fives uh, over the last decade uh, on this course. And it's made up for some of the, you know, poorer scores he's had on some on other par threes and fours. But uh, another interesting stat that I will leave you, uh, leave everybody with here, every winner since 2006 has had a previous top 25 before uh, in this tournament. And again, that goes to John's point that he made earlier here. It's just we are not finding guys that have no success or are brand new to this course to win. It just doesn't happen. Uh, so I, I think it's really vital to try to at least find some guys that have had some sort of ability um, to, uh, to have had some good success here uh, in years past. Yeah, that's a that's kind of a big thing, you know. It's uh, sometimes you try to find those value plays in the triple digits, which we may find one or two here. But uh, you know, trends like that, you know, golf courses don't change too much. So. All right, um, talking about the featured groups here on Thursdays and Fridays, token. Um, one of them I like. Your boy Siwoo is paired up with Jason Day and, and Patrick Cantlay. I will go out on a limb and say I think the winner's coming from this group here. Ooh, that, that, that is a hot take. I'm actually kind of shocked that you said it. I mean, it'll, I'll have a little more to come with this uh, group in particular, but I do not think a winner will come from this group. I'm not going to say it's not going to happen, but I do not like that thought. Yeah, I, uh, I really like Cantlay in this spot, but uh, we'll talk about it again with the Futures Bets. Plus 650 as the favorite is just, uh, just not enough for me. But uh, you got – Day, Kim, and Cantlay. You got Jordan Spieth, Mr. Waste Management, Ricky Fowler, and the previous champ, Nick Taylor. And then on Friday, you get Philly Mickelson, Paul Casey, Max Homa, and then a less than stellar one, Francesco Molinari, Brant Snedeker, and Stuart Sink. Uh, tell you what, Tony, if you had to pick one of those guys to win next on tour, who would you, who would you put your money on if you could make uh, that kind of bet? Out of everybody you just mentioned? No, Molinari, Snedeker, oh. and Sink. Wow, what a weird group. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a strange question. Wow. Um, well, I don't think I could choose Stuart Sink uh, just because he's like nearing 50. 50. Yeah. Um, I mean, Francesco is the the best player, you know, uh, uh, out of those that group, but uh, he just does. I don't know if he pl plays enough. Uh, that's a weird question. Um, I, I uh, yes, I, I'll I'll go yeah, with well Snedeker done. just because of volume. I mean, he's going to play more tournaments uh, than Molinari. Um, I don't know. I'm going to answer the question, I guess, as well as I can. Uh, my yeah. answer would be Brant Snedeker. Don't worry, there's uh, not a gun to your head. So I know, but I take things seriously, as you know. So uh, yes, well, Snedeker. it's serious when there's two guns to your head. <laughs> uh, oh man. All right, well, let's get into that futures market. Again, like I said, Patrick Cantley is the favorite on William Hill currently at plus 650 at this point. You also have a couple other guys, Daniel Berger, 14 to 1, Casey, 16 to 1, and the aforementioned Jordan Speed, also at 16 to 1 here. So, token, as we do every week, you're going to start us off double digits, and I guess Patrick Cantley in the single digits. Uh, where do we like in this spot? I only have one golfer on this radar. Because I'm going to come up with another one later, but and the only one I bet so far, and probably the only one I'm going to bet through the weekend, Ches Reeve at seventy to one. A lot of good history with this course. Uh, finished what was it, the 2019 U.S. Open, top ten. I mean, it's going to play a little different, but he's familiar with the course. Good stat to look at. Uh, greens and regulation, pretty good. I think he's going to gain a decent amount of strokes against the field with his putting though and that's going to set him above the bar all right it looks like we lost john parr so uh, maybe he went to go fill the glass again um <laughs> maybe <laughs> <laughs> uh so tony why don't you go ahead and give me a double digit feature here or two or three or five yeah so uh in 
uh, that uh, realm, I also have uh, Ches Revi. Um, already bet him. Uh, he's he's higher in a couple of spots, uh, actually. In fact, if uh, anybody out there in the Nevada uh, realm, he's a hundred at Circa, I think, currently. So uh, that, that's a pretty good number. But um, speaking yeah, of, you talked about. Sorry to interrupt you, but you yeah, talked go ahead. About this on the Super Bowl podcast. Um, I'd love to see it if you were at if you're at Circa this weekend. How much you know? Talk to the guys. How much money is going in? Remember, we talked about the nose. You know, we talked about the no MVPs. You talked about how much handle goes in on these golf ones. I'd love to see if, if you get down there this weekend and, and, and maybe get some get one of their ears and see what they yeah, say. I'll ask. Absolutely. No problem. Um, yeah, so besides him, I also have Matthew Neesmith, uh, which we found, I think, same place. Uh, it looks like Circa at 85 to 1. I know he's uh, 70 and 80 in a few spots. Uh, Matt been playing extremely well here, finally, and I think coming into his own in his second full season now on tour. Uh, he's been rolling four top 20s uh, this season already. He was 11th here last year in his first time, so at least he's played in this tournament before, which is good, um, and he had a good result uh, before that. So I, I, I like him there. Um, Joel Damon is interesting uh, around 65 or 70 to one depending upon where you look um, he's a guy that would kind of fit the mold here in a course like this I think but um, I haven't fired on him yet but the other two here I'll go quick uh, Russell Knox at 80 to one uh, out here, right here at Will Hill and uh, Scott Stallings um, who really varies I see I see anything from 70 to 95 uh, out there Scott is a good record here um, he's he's played extremely uh, well here throughout the years he has um, most of his finishes are in the top 30. Um, he seems to make the cut consistently. Um, so I just kind of a nice enough spot. I, I think near a hundred again, I haven't fired on him yet. Uh, there's another one that I haven't actually gone through, but, uh, uh, the other, the others I have. So Russell Knox, uh, Neesmith and Ches Revy are my three of this, uh, this, not these numbers. You're right on. All right. So I've only got one guy. I don't have any long shots. I told you the winner's coming out of that first pairing of day, Kim and Cantley. I'm taking an 18 to one Jason day to win this whole thing this weekend. All right, token, find me some long shots, some basement dwellers. Uh, I'll, I'll pull one out of my ass. Like I usually do uh, with a long shot and give you Nate Lashley. I mean, probably not going to bet it, but if I had to choose one tip of captain, Nate Lashley. Lash. And uh, yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll fire here. I have, three guys I've already bet. Um, again, I'm just trying to find some value with guys that have played well here. That uh, makes some sense. Um, Harry Higgs at 125 to one, which you'll find 125. It seems like it's everywhere. That same number, all five places, uh, at least uh, that I'm at here in Nevada. So that makes it easy. Uh, Troy Merritt at 200. Again, a relatively local dude uh, from the area. Uh, still has a house uh, in the vicinity. I know. I think he's still living up in Idaho for the most part, but uh, he's comfortable here uh, as well um, and reads these greens extremely well. His, his best surface is POA for sure, uh, putting wise. And then I think maybe the best value of the week, as weird as this is, going to sound really weird, uh, is uh, Ricky Barnes at 500 to 1. I think he just got into the field on Monday or Tuesday. But, um, Another local guy from Stockton, and uh, he's got a nice record here throughout the years. Again, I know he's been struggling over the last four or five uh, uh, years, but he's made three straight cuts. Uh, I think he had a top 30 a couple of weeks ago, um, or maybe in Hawaii. I can't really remember, but uh, Barnes at 500, he's a really streaky player. I think there's something to that. If you can get a really streaky player who's familiar, um, likes playing out here at 500 to one, I, I think. I think that's very viable. So uh, that's my real long shot, I guess, uh, of the week. But uh, those are my three at this level. And it looks like we've got John connected back up here. Or maybe we don't. He's looking at fish. <laughs> maybe we do. Maybe we don't. John, you with us? We got, we got Johnny Parr here. Come on. All right, John Parr. We've gone through right. – so we've gone through both – clumps so just give us everything you got in the futures market perfect easy uh strim kevin strim and where you at token i'm, I'm uh really 30 30 to one currently on little hill okay i got 35 to one at DraftKings. way last five years second last year seventh sixth 14th 17th for kevin Strowman. it's getting worse yeah, it's getting worse to 17th. Yeah, it's getting <laughs> bad. It's getting really bad. Uh, love Strowman every way this week. 
I love Strowman every way this week. Get him 35 to 1 on DraftKings. You get him top 5 at 750 to 1. You get him top 10 at 350 to 1. You got a top 20 at 165. Okay? This is not a lock like I had last week with uh, Zach Johnson versus Ryan Moore. But uh, this is a great play this week on courses that are unique. You need to look at courses that are unique uh, with past, uh, past, past winners or past, uh, past experience or what, what have you. Um, there's a lot of people on these unique golf courses like uh, Pebble Beach that don't do well. Uh, Jason Day, Jordan Spieth, uh, Phil, Phil Mickelson plays well at Pebble Beach. Um, you need to look at these guys in the matchups only except for Kevin Schumann this week at 35 to 1. Um, what a, am I going in the matchups here? No, just is that all you got for futures? That's all I got. Kevin Schumann, I have no bottom dwellers, so let's let's move on. Actually, <laughs> go ahead. You can start the long shots just in case we lose, or you can start the matchups just in case we lose. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll start the matchups. Uh, guys, we're looking at this week uh, is uh, Henrik Norlander. Uh, any matchup you can get. Second, Torrey Pines a couple weeks ago. He's uh, three for three, last three starts at top 25s. Uh, he went from 39th to 25th, the last two uh, Pebble Beaches. Uh, like I said, this is a very unique tournament. You need to look at where you're playing instead of current form. Um, and then uh, as we talked about earlier, uh, Tony Finau, early rounds. I love what you guys said earlier about uh, let's bet Tony Finau in the early rounds going forward. Uh, and guys like Xander, Xander's going to be coming through on the weekend. Uh, this is one of those things where you have to think about the psychology aspect of it. Let's start looking at uh, Finau in the early rounds and Xander on Friday and Saturday. Uh, but I got four just sort of weird shots here. You got Putnam versus Moore. Uh, Ryan Moore, we're looking to fade him. He's just been getting crushed the last few weeks. Uh, Andrew Putnam, uh, minus 10 versus Ryan Moore. Uh, you got Mark Hubbard, who is sort of on the leaderboard last week against Charlie Hoffman at minus 110. You got Phil Mickelson uh, coming through with uh, one of those like Augusta type knowledge of the course things against uh, Russell Knox at minus 106. And my dog, Sam Burns, against Cameron Davis, uh, even money. Oh, that, see, that goes against everything you said. That's his, he's never played here, Sam Burns. Come on, John. Well, <laughs> That's his dog, though. Hey, <laughs> this is dog. my dog. All right, fair dog. enough. I got I to I gotta roll. I got to roll. <laughs> I tell you what, uh, John, uh, I, I'll, you can pick any golfer for me, and I bet they'll have a better score than Shoffley this week. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> All right, Token, what do you got for matchups, my man? All right, so matchups, I'll, I'll go in terms of low value to heavy, and I'm going to start out with Norn over Norlander in this one. I, I think Nor Norn's got some value on him, especially at plus 120 is what I see it at currently on William Hill. I see John's chin. I <laughs> know, uh, yeah. <laughs> he already knew I was on that one. It could uh, be worse. <laughs> yeah. Uh, next, we got Nick Taylor over uh, Kirk, minus 105. And then moving up to the higher value ones, I am going kind of against John in this one, but not necessarily with the same golfer. I'm taking Siwoo over Burns at even money. And then the big dump of the account this week Ooh. is Chez Reedy <laughs> over, over Snedeker at minus 105. Nice. Oh, man. And I'm close with that one too, Token. It's it's good to hear that you're on it. That's the one that I'm kind of I've circled like three times. I don't know if I'm going to bet it or not, but I'm just not sure that's a good enough number. But uh, yeah, it's well, Reeve's got a win, so 
Yeah, I, no, I, I, that's absolutely the side I like in that matchup for sure. Um, it just seems so obvious, uh, you know, that everyone is going to want to take Snedeker. You know, he's won a couple times here, but I think Revy's the better player at this point. I, I, I agree. Um, that makes some sense. So I don't know if I'll get there. Hopefully I do. Uh, but I'll be quick. I have five that I've already bet. Um, two of them are Alex Noren, uh, just for you, Aaron. We got Noren over Phil Mickelson, minus 115. We got Noren over Cabrera Bayo, minus 130 at Westgate. I uh, have Francesco Molinari over Spieth, minus 110 at stations. Uh, there is a theme here, and I'll get to it in a second. Uh, Matt Jones over Streelman, plus 125. And Harry Higgs over Mark Hubbard, minus 110. Uh, but the last two of those are at Will Hill. Um, my theme here, anti streelman Spieth, Mickelson, and such. I do think the lack of amateurs is going to matter in this event. In fact, I've, I've seen it quotes from all three of these guys and uh, Streelman has talked about not having Larry Fitz there who he plays with, uh, you know, on a yearly basis. Um, he's not exactly sure. Yeah. You know how it's going to go. I mean, that's what he looks forward to the most. Um, Cause I know they're good friends, you know, at their club, uh, whisper rock uh, in Arizona and Mickelson just loves being around everybody and talking to everyone. And, you know, that's, you know, his jam. I think that's one of the reasons why he is the all time money leader uh, in this tournament. So, uh, Spieth is, uh, loves this event too. I think for that reason, um, I'm going to fade these guys. Uh, if I, if we can, I didn't find a lot of good matchups for it, but those are the three that I think I came up with the best. Um, I think it's going to have a, I think it's going to matter. Uh, the fact that it's just a, a regular event, the fact that it's going to play 200 yards longer. It's usually play 6,900. Um, during the program, it's going to play its full 7,000, you know, and change, uh, here. Um, I, I, I think that's kind of where I'm at. Um, yeah, you know, in that regard. Uh, and then the last one is Higgs over Mark Hubbard. I just think Harry Higgs is, is due here. He's, uh, he's been playing a lot better. Yeah. Hubbard's a grinder. He's all, he's a grinder. He's tough. I, I, I agree. He's one of our guys. I, I respect the hell out of him, but I just, Higgs is a much better player. Um, and the fact that he played for the first time last year and finished in the top 20, uh, that means a lot. So, um, to me, so I'm going to go with, uh, Higgs over Hubbard. Very nice. I only have one matchup, and it uh, it tails my my futures bet, and that's Jason Day over Cameron Davis. I'll lay the one fifteen in that spot. So there you go. All right, Token, make us a millionaire. Your daily All fantasy right. from DraftKings here. I actually did pretty good in my uh, DraftKings last yes. week. Uh, six out of six made the cut. Uh, the free contest I signed up for, I was fifth out of two hundred, so pretty solid. Wow, very golf cool. club. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it was uh, 557 points. Pr- pretty solid overall. Yeah. Uh, this now, week, can you do it again? I I like the chances this week. I think we got a winner, th- two additional top fives, and the rest in the top 20. So, mm. wow. That, that will Calling be. Calling your shot. <laughs> yeah. That, <laughs> That'd be a strong one for sure. Uh, we're going to start out with Siwoo in this one for 9,400. I, I like his style on this course. If he is able to make those kind of short mid-range putts and gain a few shots over the field, I really like him. I do like Strelman for the daily fantasy this week. I'm not going to lie. I did see some value on him for 8,900. I like it. Uh, moving on, we got Norn. I, I see value on him for 8300 and a guy that probably most other uh, pickers won't, won't have. I definitely uh, wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> we got Nick Taylor for 7600 as well as Ooh. Maverick McNeely for the same price. I, I like McNeely. Wow. The only thing I don't like about him coming into this tournament is he adjusted some uh, – of his uh, swings and stuff like that and ch- changing before tournaments is not ideal. So, but he's local, you know, he's, he, he's from he the Northern local. California area. Yeah, it helps. Yeah. yeah, it definitely helps. So I, I, I couldn't take him off of this for that, but that's why I didn't have him in anything else. And plus he shot down in value, especially in the futures market. I saw yesterday he was 80 to one to win the tournament shot down to s- actually 50 at one point and now it was back up to 70 uh, and then saving the best for last we got Chez Reavy for 7500 we got the winner mm. oh yes whenever you say this I usually have this guy this is yes let's let this come through be great 
Absolutely. What, uh, Tony, I want to, what are your opinions on this? Normally this isn't a, a big, uh, you know, this, this event is more focused on the AMs and the celebrities. And you talk about you're not, you know, the Nick Taylor who is a defending champ here. Yeah, interesting. So now is the focus, is he going to have to be some kind of ambassador this week? Interesting. That's a great question. I never I actually did not think of that until you just said it. Um, great question. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how that's going to change things. Um, you know, it, it, maybe it'll lessen the blow a little bit because I would guess that he would probably be playing with that same set amateur uh, and, and that might be a big deal. Um that might take away a little bit more of his time and, and be more of a thing versus now he doesn't have to worry about that side of it. And it's just more of a regular esque tournament. Yeah. He's still defending, but it's, it's not exactly the same tournament. Um, no, great question. Uh, I don't know how it would have an effect there. And so I guess I couldn't handicap it, but that's a, hmm. uh, it's really an interesting point. Um, yeah, something I, I thought I'm about. not sure. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and Nick's an interesting guy. Uh, you know, he's been grinding now for a while. Uh, you know, back up and down, you know, mini tours to uh, to main tour. Always had a ton of talent, big hitter. Uh, but, um, yeah, it's nice to see him really finally break through, uh, you know, with a big win uh, last year. Obviously, it's a big-time tournament. So, yeah, um, I don't know. That's a great question. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I just sort of avoided him, not positively or negatively. Uh, he just didn't come up on my radar for anything this week. Gotcha. All right, and to wrap the show, we have the new segment edition of John Parr's One and Done. All right, great. And, and if I could preface this, uh, I, I want to make a little bet with Mr. Tony Johnson and Mr. Token. All right, so Mr. Token, who'd you have against uh, Sam Burns this week? That was, uh, let me pull it up, uh, Siwoo. Siwoo, okay. So I'll take Burns against Siwoo for five push-ups. Tony. Okay. All right, against Streel, man, who you got? Four push-ups. Uh, against Streels, I got Matt Jones. Matt Jones, okay. So Matt we got Jones. Matt who? Jones, Mr. Jones. All right, so I would take five push-ups against you as well. Five pays six because I'm plus 125. So you do six, I do five. <laughs> I'll count I weigh, what I, I weigh, Hey, I'm plus 125 on you on the weight. I guarantee that. Uh, oh, because if you you weigh more, is that what yeah? Because I weigh more, because that's uh, that's a part of it, right? Okay. Either way, I'll take my six for sure. Five, Tony, Thank you. our token. Five for five is fine uh, with me. Yeah. Should I should I use your Tony? Should I use your value against token or no? What? It's up to you. Should I use your? Okay, hey, so your six versus my five token. Come on. <laughs> My guys, guys if, even. Also, if you're watching the, uh, if you're if you're listening to this, we're gonna have this podcast in video form next week. This so is watch, great. You can watch the podcast. I, I'm down. I, I oh, really, w- I really <laughs> wish you guys were here right uh, now. Uh, either way, I, I don't know if I want to be there. <laughs> either, all right, all right. I got six to five. Uh, 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 Tony. Uh, er, John, John let, let, let's up it. Eight, then, eight uh, for eight. Then eight for eight. Oh, okay. Bumping it up on the other yeah. side. Okay. Lucky eight. All right. Let's move about- in. Let's move in. One and done this week. Uh, just killed it this week. I had Xander, 650 k sure Great. Uh, Should have had a win, obviously. You know, you can't really expect too much from Xander as far as winning. But, wow. Harsh. Uh, <laughs> <geez>. <laughs> Damn. He's won four times in four years. Damn. It hurts. As, as Tony would tell you, he won the tour championship one time, and so that did Brent Hedeker. <laughs> I think Happy Gilmore won at one uh, time too. Yeah, yeah see, Bill, uh, they Bill. both did. That's correct. Yep, you both, Bill both are correct. Bill Haas won at one time. He Bill got Haas up and well. down out of the water, and uh, look yep. at him now. So, That's true. Whatever. All right. So either way, uh, so this uh, one and done, guys. I, I I got Xander for 650k this week. I went from 28th to 10th. Uh, I'm at 1.13 million for four tournaments this year. Uh, the leader is at 1.8 million through four tournaments this year. So he's averaging, you know, a little bit over 400 K. So what I've figured out with this uh, one and done gig, you, you need to get three, like 200 K and above because anything above 200 K you're going to, you're going to make up for your missed cuts and your top 25s and whatnot. Um, but this week, I'm having a tough time. I would love to hear your input on uh, who I should take. And I got two guys. I got Streelman. Uh, as I said, he's the horse for the course. 
But I love what Tony said earlier as far as uh, the pro-am side of things. And then I got Daniel Berger, uh, which where Daniel Berger had the miscut last week, unfortunately. But uh, last four starts before that, he's got uh, all tw top 25s and two top 10s. Uh, so I'd love to hear you guys' input, and uh, I'm willing to be persuaded. Uh, Daniel Berger making his first appearance on the show, uh, the second favorite here at 14 to Amazing. 1. Well, first yeah. appearance at the end of the show here. So uh, I'll defer to you guys. You guys uh, have a take. Do not suck. Please do. Uh, out of the two that you gave, I would say Strillman. <laughs> but my pick for sure is still Revy, So Yeah, the big thing was uh, – so you got to think about these one-and-done fantasy leagues. So – Maybe I saved Burger for a better time. So Burger's mm -hmm. someone that I can, you know, Strillman I'm not going to use for the rest of the year. This would be the only time Fair. I would use him. So maybe I should take Strillman. Well, then I think you made Berger, your choice. Yeah, I think I do. And uh, Tony, I would love to hear your input on this. Okay, my input is know your field. So whoever you're – you know the people that you're up against, right? So you have an idea of who they like to take. Do people like to take favorites? Do they like to take specific players? Do they have, you know, whatever that type of thing? Because you don't want to be on the same players as others. I assume you're swinging for the fences. You're trying to hit a grand slam and win this thing, right? I, I, I would expect – treat it like a, uh, you know um, – you know, th like thing with the NFL, you know, if to pick a one winner each week, you know, you do not want to be on favorites. Like that's not how you win those, uh, those type of, of pools. So can't take Cantley. Cantley, a lot of people are going to be on and Berger's the second choice off the board. So I would want to be shying away from a guy like that. Um, it's not like you want to be saving necessarily people here or there. Guys change their schedules all the time. It's not like the NFL where you can kind of look, you know, to week eight, you know, there's a soft matchup. It, it just doesn't work like that with golf. Uh, you know, if I have those two options based on trying to win a pool like this you know from the you know mathematical side of things i think you have to go with streelman just because you don't want the guy that's second off the board um in i love general. that tony man and thank you guys for your input because but you're uh, but streelman's you not very, a good pick. very very <laughs> sharp very sharp and i can't wait to see you do your push-ups next week and aaron just take it away for the closer yeah i can't wait to see those either you can catch those on our youtube channel uh you can youtube search vegas squares podcast or it'll be on uh, the 12-ounce website as well. So, all right, as we wrap up here, obviously I want to thank the sponsors. First and foremost, 12-Ounce Sports, who airs us every week in audio and video formats. Please check us out and all the shows at 12ozsportsnetwork.com. While you're there, visit the 12-Ounce store. You can get anything from show merch, golf polos, coffee mugs, beach towels, much, much more. 12ozsportsnetwork.com. Also, our title sponsors here, both Vice Golf and Fanatics, they are available with dedicated affiliate links on lvsquares.com. Click those links when you're shopping for that sports fan or golfer in your life and use our dedicated affiliate links because it helps out the podcast. It keeps the podcast going and we're greatly appreciative because uh, we love, you know, we love Vice Golf. We love Fanatics. We love you guys. And we hope you continue to support us. The Heater Bet Tracking app available on the iPhone and coming soon to the Android. Independent sports data and entertainment company focused on enhancing your betting experience with live in-play bet trackers and real bet monitoring. Track your bets and your live scores all in one place. Keep track of your bankroll management with the Heater Sports Betting app. And also our local guy, Kevin Packpacko and Pro-Am Customs. Customized golf clubs are not just for the pros. They are for everyone. At Pro-Am Customs, the only limit is your imagination. Message them on Instagram, at Pro-Am Customs, to get started on your order today. Please tell them that the Vegas Square sent you. All right, guys, that's going to do it for us and the Pebble Beach Pro-Am. Speaking of Pro-Am. Uh, no am this week, but hopefully we get to see some push-ups out of somebody, and I can't wait for next week's podcast. So for that, for Spike, I keep saying for Spike, for Token Tony, <laughs> for Token Spike. Tony, for Tony Johnson, for John Parr, I am Eric. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you listening. Good luck on your picks. Good luck on your bets. Enjoy the Pebble Beach Pro-Am, and we'll see you on the next one.